And this is the complete guide to building a GraphQL API with JavaScript. Now GraphQL is gaining a lot of popularity right now because it is vastly superior to traditional REST APIs. Big companies like GitHub, Facebook and Yelp are all moving to GraphQL because it's so much better. During this course, I will show you how to build a GraphQL API with JavaScript. This course is structured in five parts. I'll start by explaining the basic principles of GraphQL. After that, we'll make some preparations and start implementing our GraphQL API. Finally, we will take a look at Graphical, a great tool for testing your GraphQL API. To make this all a bit more realistic, we will create a GraphQL API for a blog. I have a small database with blog posts, authors, and comments that we will use as the basis for our API. To follow along, you'll need some basic knowledge of JavaScript and Node.js. You don't need to be a programming expert though. The code and examples that I use throughout this course are simple and self-explanatory. So basic knowledge is just fine. After finishing this course, you will be able to build your own GraphQL API with JavaScript. So what are you waiting for? GraphQL is a query language that was developed by Facebook in 2012 while they were working on their native iOS and Android applications. What they needed was an API that was flexible, efficient, and one that could work with the relational data that Facebook has. They ended up creating GraphQL because no other tool could solve their problem. GraphQL has many features that make it a great choice for building an API. So let's go over some of them. First of all, GraphQL is very efficient. It allows the client to ask for what information it needs and the server will respond with only that data. It's also possible to run multiple queries in a single request and you can navigate the relationships of entities as well. For example, you can ask GraphQL for a list of your friends and the name of their friends. GraphQL will return exactly that and it won't include fields that you haven't requested, such as date of birth or email. Secondly, GraphQL uses a type system. This creates a contract between the client and the server and it allows the server to validate an incoming query and provide meaningful error messages should something be wrong with it. Now as a user of an API, the type system gives you additional safety because you know what type of data the API will return. Thirdly, GraphQL exposes just one endpoint for your entire API and it is constructed in a way that allows you to evolve your API without breaking backwards compatibility. In fact, Facebook says that they have never versioned their GraphQL API and that older versions of their applications still work with newer versions of their API. It's said that GraphQL is the last API that you should deploy. Pretty awesome, right? And finally, GraphQL is not tied to any specific database or storage engine. You can connect it up to your existing code base and your existing databases. You can even use multiple databases together to power a single API. So that was a quick overview of what GraphQL is. In the next video, we will compare GraphQL to traditional REST APIs. Let's assume that we have an API for a blog. Our blog is rather simple and it contains three types of objects, blog posts, authors, and comments. The relationship between these are fairly obvious. Blog posts are written by a single author and blog posts might have one or more comments. Now let's take a look at how you can build an API for this using the REST principle. You would start by creating a single endpoint per entity. Want to get the details about a blog post and this would contain the title and the contents of the post. Another one to get the details of a comment and this would include the name of the poster and of course the content of the comment itself. We'll also add one to get the details of an author which will return us the name and an email address for example. 
And you should also be able to list all the blog posts on the website. And so you add a fourth endpoint that returns a list of blog posts IDs. Now this architecture seems fine, but let's actually use it. I want to render a list of blog posts where we show the title of each post and the name of the author. So we'll start by making a request for the latest blog posts and the API will answer with an array containing the references to some of these posts. After that, I need to make one request per blog post to get the title and the contents of each. But this response contains yet another reference. This time a post references an author. So in order to know who wrote the post, I need to make another set of requests to get the name of each of the authors. And this is what the API would return. Now this example is a bit exaggerated, but it demonstrates the pain point of REST APIs. In real life applications, you'll definitely come across situations where you have to make multiple requests to the server to get all the data that you need. This can be painfully slow because each trip to the server adds a lot of latency and that is not great for mobile connections, for example. Now, you might want to be tempted to add a few endpoints to solve this problem. You could add a post with authors endpoint to return a list of posts together with the details about the author. And then you can add another one to return comment counts as well. But this is not a very scalable solution. This will cause an explosion of endpoints that will be hard to maintain and hard for new people to learn how to use. So let's now take a look at how GraphQL solves these issues. With GraphQL, you can make a single request and ask for all the resources that you want. So here I can say, I want the latest post with the name of the authors. The GraphQL server will then look up the blog post for you. It will follow the relationships to author and it will fetch all the information about the author and it will return everything to you in a single request. Now I'd like to point out here that the response of a GraphQL query has the exact same shape of your query. Now this is very useful because you'll know in advance how the API is going to respond. And with the REST API, that's just not the case. So here we can see on the left that we query for posts and on the right, we receive a object from GraphQL, which contains a post array containing objects with all of the attributes that we want. So that's title content and then an author object with a name property. So to summarize with GraphQL, you can get multiple resources in a single request. The structure of your query defines the structure of the response. GraphQL also understands the relationship between your objects and it can look them up if it's needed. And finally, you always get the data that you need, never too much and never too little. So that was it for this lesson. In the upcoming videos, I will explain the main concepts of GraphQL. So let's start with fields. GraphQL is all about asking for data and you can be very specific as to what parts of the data that you want to receive. So let me show you what a basic query in GraphQL looks like. So I'm gonna start by saying that we wanna query something and then I'm gonna say I wanna query posts and I wanna receive the title of each blog post. So this is a very simple query. And if I run this, we'll get a response from GraphQL. It just says posts, it gives us an array of objects and each object contains just the title of our post because that's the only thing we've asked for. So in this case, query here is the name of the operation while posts and title are both fields. Fields are very important in GraphQL and they are a unit of data that you can ask for. And it doesn't matter how deep in the query these fields appear, they're always called fields uh, and they always behave in the same way, even if you nest them. Now you can also make a subselection of fields. So let's say I also wanna know who wrote uh, these blog posts. Well, all I have to do is I have to say, well, I want the posts with the title, but I also wanna know about the author. An author is actually an object, so here I can define which fields of author that I want. And so if I hit control space, graphical tells me that author has an ID, a name, an email, and a, a post property, and I can pick any one of these. So I'm gonna say, well, I want the name of an author, 
And then if I execute this query, I get an author field inside my posts. And this is of course an object again, which contains the name of the author. Now, of course, you can nest these fields even further if your data structure allows it. Now, as said in the previous video, the ability to query multiple resources and their relationship in a single request make GraphQL a lot more efficient than REST API. So in this case, I've queried for the latest posts, I've grabbed their title, and I've gone through their relationship with the author entity, and I've also grabbed the name uh, of the author that is assigned to the post. In a REST API, this would have taken multiple requests to the server. Now let's move on to arguments. Fetching objects in the fields are pretty easy in GraphQL as we've just seen, but sometimes you need to give some arguments. For example, you might want to fetch a particular blog post based on its ID. So I'm gonna clear out our existing query and I'm gonna say that I want a post and I'm gonna give it an argument and I'm gonna say that the ID of the post that I wanna fetch is three, for example. And I'm gonna open the brackets, I'm gonna say, give me the title of post with ID three. So if I run this, I get exactly the title of blog post with ID three. Now in a traditional REST system, you can only pass a single set of arguments to the server. In GraphQL, however, every field and nested object can have its own set of arguments. So let's say you wanna fetch the comments of this blog post, then I simply add comments to it. And I can say for each comment, I want a name and this will work. There we go. So there was one comment written by Peter, but now I can also pass an argument to comments and I can say, for example, well, give me the comments of the year 2017, for example. And so if I run this, GraphQL will make it work just fine. It will fetch post with ID three. It will look up the comments of this post that might be in another database table, for example. It will filter them on year using our second argument and then it will return all of the data that I requested. So that was it for this video. Those were fields and arguments. In the next video, we're going to take a look at aliases and fragments. Let's start with aliases. You might have spotted an issue with the way queries are executed in GraphQL. The output of a GraphQL query has the same name as the query itself. So in this case, I've taken the example of the previous video and I ask for post ID three and I ask its title and its contents. Now notice that I type in here post and that I get post back in the response. But what if I want to get the details of two specific posts? I cannot write something like this, post ID two, and then grab title and content of that post. Because if I do that, GraphQL will say that the fields posts are conflicting with each other because again, they are the same name. So that is why aliases exist in GraphQL. They allow you to rename the result of a field to anything else that you want. So you could query both of these posts by saying that the first one is first post, Oops. And that the second one is second post. And if I run it now, GraphQL will rename the output of this post and it will name it first post, as you can see here in the response object. Now, aliases are ideal to query the same type of objects more than one time, but your queries also get very repetitive. As you can see here in this example, now let's make this example a little bit more complete. Let's say that we wanna fetch the title, the contents of each post along with the name of the author. So here I have to say, well, I want the author and I want the name of the author and then I copy paste it also to our second post. There we go. Now, this is quite repetitive. All the code between the brackets is exactly the same for both of these posts. And that brings us to fragments. By using fragments, we can remove the duplicated fields and put them inside a reusable block of code. So we can start by defining our fragment and we start by giving it a name. So we'll say fragment basic post details. And then we have to say what this fragment is compatible with. So this fragment is compatible with the post type. So I'm gonna say that it works on the post type. And then I'm gonna copy the selected fields uh, in our fragment. 
Now afterwards, we can use this fragment inside of our queries. So we can rewrite these two queries by removing all of our fields and simply saying dot 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 basic post details. And I'm going to copy that, paste it in there as well. And that's it. If I run this now, I get the exact same output, but I have not copy and pasted this piece of code endlessly. I can just reuse it by referencing its name. Now you might notice that the syntax looks a bit like the new spread operator in JavaScript. And as you can see, it greatly reduces the size of your queries. So that was it for this video. In the next video, we're going to take a look at how you can use variables inside your GraphQL queries. So far, we've been writing arguments directly inside our queries. And here is an example of one of the previous videos where we fetched the details of post with ID three. And as you can see, I passed the argument three directly in my query. Now, in most applications, however, the arguments are dynamic and usually depend on user input. Uh, for example, authors might have a form to create a new blog post. So it's not a good idea to take the form data to serialize it and to insert it into this query. Not only could it be a security issue, it also creates a completely new query that might have become invalid. Instead, we can use variables inside our queries and then pass along the user input separately. And this is how it goes. So we'll start by saying that our query accepts a variable. So I'm going to say that our query accepts a variable called post ID and I'm going to say that it's of type integer and I'm going to say that this post ID is required by adding an exclamation mark. So this means that the variable is mandatory and GraphQL will not continue executing this query if it's not present. Now after declaring the variable, we can use it inside of our query. So here we fetch details of post with ID three, but instead of three, I can now use our variable post ID just like this. Now, of course, we also need to pass the value of this variable to the server. And to do that, we create a JSON object and send it along with this request to the server. And in graphical, there is an, a section here called query variables. And all I do here is I write a curly brace and graphical auto completes me and it says, well, I need a post ID variable and then I can give that variable. So here I can say that the value of post ID equals three and then that's it. If I execute this query again, you'll see it has the exact same response as my previous query. Uh, but right now I'm using query variables. Now these variables are sent along with our request as for example, a post parameter. Now by using variables, we can keep the query the same for all requests. Again, this query here will never change. We just send the user input along with the request. And this is considered a best practice. It's not recommended to use string interpolation to construct a new query, because again, this could be a potential security issue. So that was it for this video. In the next video, we'll take a look at what mutations are and what the differences are between queries and mutations. In GraphQL, there are two types of operations, queries and mutations. You've already seen many examples of queries in the previous videos, and they allow you to fetch data from the server. And this is typically read only. Queries should not change any data on your server, even though you technically could make them do that. To change data on your server, you should instead use mutations. Just as queries, mutations can return objects and you can define which fields you want to receive as a response. So in case of a block, the API might have a mutation to add new blog posts. This mutation should accept a JSON object with the contents of the new post. So let's take a look at how you can do that in GraphQL. We'll start off by saying that we want to run a mutation. So I'm going to type mutation, open curly brackets. And just as with queries, I can now give it the name of a mutation. So I've already created a mutation at post and this accepts a post variable, which is a JSON object containing the details of my new post. So this could be title 
my new blog post. My blog post also has some content and it should be contents of my blog post. It also has an author and this is a reference to the ID of the author. And so in this case, it's just some random data that I've generated uh, in a database. So this is the data that we pass along to this mutation. And then we can also say which data we want to receive back from GraphQL. And we can receive back the title of our blog post. And I can even ask for the author and I can ask for the name of the author that is associated with this ID right here. Now, in the previous video, I told you that putting this data straight in the query is not a great idea. Instead, we should use variables, and that is also possible with mutations. So just as with queries, we'll start by saying that our mutation takes a post variable as input. So I'm going to do that right here. I'm going to say that we're going to receive a variable post, and this should be of type post input. Now, post input is a type that I have defined on the GraphQL server. And later on in the course, I'll show you how you can do that yourself. Now this variable is required, so I'm going to add an exclamation mark to it. Now afterwards, I can start using this variable inside our post field. So instead of giving it the object straight away here, I'm going to cut that text away and I'm going to just reference the post variable. And now I can pass along our post as a variable to GraphQL. And here I can pass along the object for our blog post. So this was the object that I created um, with title content and author. But we should wrap this inside another object, just as graphical here proposes me. And the object contains a post uh, field. This post field contains that object. And then I should close it. All right, and I should add some quotes here. And there we go. That is what a mutation looks like. If I now execute it, this will insert a new blog post in my database. And as you can see, we received the title and the name of the author as a response, just as we've requested right here. So mutations look exactly like queries and they also have a predictable response. So what's now the real difference between queries and mutations? Well, first of all, you can instantly see if a GraphQL operation will change something on the server or not. Now this is for our own convenience. Queries will only read data from the server while mutations will change or add new data to it. The other big difference is that queries are being executed in parallel while mutations run in series one after the other. This is to prevent race conditions as one mutation might insert data that is required by the next mutation. So that was it for this video and also for this section. In the next section, we will get ready to write our own GraphQL API. I will show you how to set up the project structure, what dependencies we're going to use and much more. So here I have opened up an empty directory in Visual Studio Code, and we're going to start by creating a few directories that will make up our project. I'm going to start by creating a directory for all of our source code. I'm going to call that SRC. Now inside this directory, I will make another folder for our GraphQL schema. What this is, is something that we will discuss in later videos. Now the schema is made up of queries, types and mutations. So I'll create a subdirectory for each one of these. So one for queries, one for types, and one for mutations. Now let's also create some placeholder files for our schema. Let's start with queries and mutations. I'm going to create one file per query and per mutation. By doing that, we make sure that each file corresponds to just one query or one mutation. It also keeps our files short and our code manageable. So for mutations, I want clients to be able to create new blog posts and to post comments through our API. So I'm going to create two mutations. The first one I'm going to call add comments.js and I'm going to create a second one, which is going to be add post.js. 
Now I'm gonna leave these files empty for now. We'll work on them later in this course. For queries, I want users to be able to get all the posts on the blog, to get details about a specific post and to get the details about an author. So I will create three files inside queries. I'm gonna create a file posts.js, which will return all the posts in our blog. I'm gonna create post.js, which is gonna return the details about a single post. And then I'm gonna create a file author.js, which is gonna return some information about an author. And again, we will implement these files later on. And also note that you can name these files however you would like. Um, I'm just picking something that makes sense here. Next up is types. Now, if you're familiar with object-oriented programming, then you can compare types in GraphQL to interfaces in object-oriented programming languages. They define what fields a type has. For example, a type for blog post might have a title, a content, and an author field. Now, in case for our API, we have three big types. We have blog posts, we have authors, and we have comments. I've detailed them in the first section of this course. So let's create a file for each and every one of those. So I'm gonna create author.js. I'm gonna create comments.js. And I'm gonna create post.js. All right, so now that we have the individual building blocks for our schema, I'm going to create an index.js file inside the schema directory. And in this file, we will import all the other files and make the complete schema. I'm also going to create an index file in the root of our source directory. And this file will be responsible for loading the GraphQL library, for loading our schema, and for executing queries. Now to finish off, we're also gonna need a dist folder, which I'm going to put in the root of our project. Now this folder will contain optimized versions of our source code and it will be generated by Babel. Uh, and this will ensure that our code runs on any version of Node.js. So with that folder created, it's time to end this video. We've set up the structure for our project. In the next video, we are going to install the external dependencies that we'll need to bring our API to life. Now to build our API, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. Instead, we're going to rely on third-party libraries that have already been built and have been battle-tested. Managing dependencies in Node.js is pretty easy because we have NPM. Now, in case you don't know, NPM stands for Node Package Manager, and this tool allows us to list all the dependencies of our project in a single file. Now, afterwards, NPM can take that file, read it out, and install all of the dependencies into our project. So to start, we're going to create a package.json file. This is the file that will tell NPM everything there is to know about our project. Now, you can create one manually, but we can also ask NPM to generate one for us in the root directory of our project. And I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna open up the terminal, and I'm gonna run NPM init. And this utility will walk us through some of the things that should be in our package.json, and we can just type them into our terminal. So it asks us, what is our package name? Well, I'm gonna say GraphQL API block. Let's say that's the name of our package. We're gonna keep it at that version number. Uh, we can give it a description, which I'm not gonna do right now. We can give it an entry point. I'm gonna leave that by default as well. Leave the test command empty, a Git repository, keywords, author. We're gonna leave that all empty. And then it asks us, is this file okay? I'm gonna say, yes, that's okay. And now this tool has created a package.json file inside our directory. So now that we have this file, we can start installing our dependencies. Now we're not going to write our own GraphQL library. That will be pointless. Instead, we're going to use the official GraphQL implementation by Facebook. So to install it, I'm simply going to run npm install dash dash save and then GraphQL. So here I ask npm to install a package. The package name is GraphQL. And by saying that it should save this dependency, it will actually add the dependency to our package.json file. So if I execute this, npm will go out, it will fetch GraphQL, it will download all of the dependencies that GraphQL has. 
and it will save GraphQL as a dependency inside our package.json file. So as you can see here, it has added a new property to this object, which is called dependencies. And here it says that GraphQL is now a dependency of our project and that we require at least version 0.11.3. You can also see that NPM has created a new directory inside our project, and this is called node modules. Now this directory is the home to all the external dependencies of our project. We should never commit node modules to a version control system, and we should never change files inside this directory. Now, if we look inside the directory, we see that there is a GraphQL folder in there, as well as a folder for all the dependencies that GraphQL needs. So in this case, GraphQL needs iterall, and that is right here. So needless to say, this directory can get quite big once you've added a few dependencies, but that is just fine. And we're going to close it up for now. And we're now going to install the next dependency that we're going to need, and that is Babel. Now, during this course, I'm going to use some of the new features in JavaScript, such as classes, arrow functions, and spread operators. These features, however, might not be available in older JavaScript runtimes. So Babel is a little tool that will take our code with all of the new syntax and it will transpile it into code that every Node.js runtime can understand. This is very useful for when you want to deploy your code to, for example, a cloud service who uses an older runtime. I'm going to use the same command as last time with one small change. So I'm going to say npm install dash dash save, but I'm going to say save def. And this will tell npm that Babel is a dependency that is only needed during development. We don't need Babel in our production environments. So npm save dash def, and I'm going to say that it should install the Babel CLI tool. It should install the default preset for Babel. This is default Babel configuration. And we're going to need a Babel plugin that will transform our spread operator into something that an older JavaScript runtime can understand. So I will execute that. And you will see that it takes a bit longer because Babel has a lot more dependencies than GraphQL. So now that it is finished, we can see that it has added another section into our package.json file. These are the development dependencies. Again, these are the dependencies that you only need during development, not in production. And if I open up the node modules directory and I hit refresh, you can see that there are a lot of new dependencies installed into our project. And that is the power of using a package manager. We don't have to manage this all ourselves. We don't have to go out and download each and every one of these projects. No, NPM will do this for us automatically. Now I'm gonna close this folder up. I said it could get quite big. That's no problem at all. And that was it for this video. We have installed all the dependencies that we're going to use to build our own GraphQL API. Now in the next video, I will show you how to configure Babel. One of those dependencies is Babel. Now we're going to use Babel to ensure that we can safely use all of the new features in the JavaScript language without having to worry about compatibility. So let's first take a look at why we need Babel by writing some code. I'm going to open up the index.js file here in the root of my source directory. And let's say that I want to import the GraphQL library and then do something with it. Well, then I would write import I want to import GraphQL and I want to import it from the GraphQL package. After that, I'm just going to run a console log saying hi to prove that the code has executed successfully. Now, let me try to run the script. I'm going to open up the terminal and I'm going to say nodes src index.js. I'm going to hit enter. And as you can see, Node.js returns an error and it says that it found an unexpected token import. So Node.js doesn't understand this new syntax here to import modules. Now we could fix it by using the old syntax, but that's not very efficient. In a lot of cases, the new syntax is a lot shorter and has some nice additional features. So that is exactly what Babel is here to solve. Now, Babel relies on a config file to tell it how it should transpile your code. Babel can load this configuration from the package.json file or from the Babel RC file. Now I'm going to use a second option and I'm going to create a new file in my root directory. 
and we're going to call this dot babelrc. In this file, we're going to create a JSON object and we're going to say what presets that are available. So in the previous video, we've installed the env preset, which is the default preset uh, that is used by uh, Babel. So I'm going to put that right there. And then we can also say what plugins are available. And notice that Visual Studio Code helps us out here. It, it knows that this file is a Babel configuration file and it gives us all these nice hints. So I'm going to say that we're going to use some plugins and we're going to use the transform object rest spread plugin so that our spread operator will correctly be transpiled. Okay, so now Babel knows which presets are available and which plugins are installed. And let's now check out if it correctly transpiles our code. So I'm gonna open up the package.json file. And in this file, I'm going to create a new script. Now, if you've never created a script in NPM before, all you have to do is give it a name and then a command that it should execute. So here it already has a test script. I'm just gonna add one. I'm gonna call my script build. Now this should execute Babel. So I'm gonna type Babel and this accepts a bunch of parameters. Now the first one tells Babel where our source code is. So in our case, it's just the, the source directory, the SRC directory. Now after that, we also need to specify where Babel should store the transpiled versions of our code. So in the previous videos, we've created the this folder just for this purpose. So I'm gonna say that the output directory, the out there is the this folder. All right, so now I'm gonna save this file and we're gonna run this script. So I'm gonna open up the terminal and I'm gonna type npm run build. I'm gonna hit enter. And as you can see, Babel found all of our source files right here and it has generated new files for them in the dist folder. So let's open up our original index.js file. You can see here, import GraphQL from the GraphQL package. But if I now go to the dist folder and I open the index file there, then you can see that our import statement is gone and Babel is now using the traditional require syntax, something that is compatible with older versions of Node. And let's test that right now. So now I'm gonna run uh, node again and instead of running the index file in our source directory I'm going to run the index file in our disk directory and There you go our script works. There are no more errors and it just prints high onto our console Now if you're a bit like me you will think that running these commands over and over again is very time-consuming And you will be right so let's change our build script so that it runs Babel and then automatically runs our code, our index.js file. So I'm gonna go back, whoops, I'm gonna go back to our package.json file. And here we have Babel, which generates uh, the transpiled versions. And after that, I'm gonna say that it should execute node this index.js file. All right, so let's run it one more time. I'm gonna say npm run build. And now the script transpiles everything with Babel and then runs it automatically as well, all in one go. So that was it for this video. We're almost done with the preparations. In the next video, I'll show you the dummy database that we're going to use as the basis for our GraphQL API. With a video of me showing how I created all this dummy data, so I've prepared a tiny database and I've put it in our source directory and it's called fake database. So let's take a look inside. As you can see, it's just a simple class containing a bunch of properties. So I have properties that store authors, that store blog posts, and that store all the comments. Now all the data is stored in a simple array. It's an array of objects. You can compare this to tables in a regular database, a table for authors, a table for blog posts, and a table for comments. I've also made some methods to access this data. And here's a simple one. If I scroll down, you can see there is get blog posts. And this one is very simple. It just returns all of the blog posts in the database. 
Now in my example, it returns the array of blog posts, which is kept in memory, of course. But in reality, instead of just returning it here, you would go out to the database, you would make a connection, you would query the database, and then you would return the data of the database. So you wouldn't just say return and then an array. You can think of these methods as a database access layer. Only one part of your application should be able to talk to your database. The rest should use methods that the database access layer exposes. So if you want to write your own GraphQL API for a block, for example, you can keep all of these methods, but you just have to re-implement their bodies. So here you would again have to make a connection to a database and so. Now I've also got some methods that filter out some of our data. So for example, get blog post, this one fetches the details of a blog post with a specific ID. And I have the same thing for fetching a particular author or fetching uh, the, the posts of an author or fetching all the comments that a post has. I have a bunch of these methods. Now I also implemented a method that is responsible for adding new data into our block. And so here there is add new blog post, which takes a parameter post, which is an object again with all the properties of the post, and we just add it to the array uh, right here. It's all very, very, very simple, but it gets the point across. So again, in reality, you would re-implement these methods and you would probably want to connect to a database like MySQL or MongoDB or maybe a cloud version like DynamoDB. Now, what about relationships? Well, each of these objects are completely self-contained. There are no references from one object to the other. But if you look more closely at blog posts, for example, you can see that each blog post has a property called author and in it we store the ID of the author who wrote this particular blog post. So if we want to fetch the name of the author of a blog post, then we should take the blog post, we should take the author property, and then we should query the database for an author with this ID and then we can fetch his name. Now you might think that creating code that navigates all these relationships will be very time consuming and you would be right. But luckily we don't need to do that because GraphQL is very smart. You only have to teach it how to fetch each resource individually and then you can tell it how the relationships are formed. So you don't have to use complex join operations like in SQL. All right, so that was it for this section. We're done with all the preparations. In the next section, we're going to start building our very own GraphQL API on top of this little database. I'll show you how to create a schema so that GraphQL will be able to make sense of all of our data. Now an object type in GraphQL is like a class in object-oriented programming. It basically tells GraphQL what kind of objects that your API can return and what fields they have. So here you have an example GraphQL query. All these fields are defined by object types. So in other words, if an object type for a post does not contain a title, then you cannot ask for a title in your query. Pretty straightforward. However, the top fields are different. They are the entry points to your queries and those are defined differently. We'll see that later on in this course. So in this video, we will focus on implementing the object types. Okay, so here I am in Visual Studio Code and let's start by implementing an object type for author. Now, in the previous videos, we've created our directory structure and the object type for author is under the types directory under schema. So I'm gonna open up author.js and I'm going to start by creating or by exporting a new constant called author and this is gonna be of new GraphQL object type. Now in this constructor, we will pass uh, an object and this object will contain all the details about our author entity. Now before we continue, we need to import the necessary module. So in this case, we're using GraphQL object type, but JavaScript doesn't know what that is. It's not defined in our file. So we need to import it uh, from the GraphQL package first. So I'm gonna write import GraphQL object type from the GraphQL package. All right, so next up, we can fill in this object uh, right here. 
every object type should have a name a description and some fields so i'm going to create them now i'm going to call this object type an author i'm going to give it a description i'm going to say all details of an author on the website and i'm going to give it some fields which is going to be uh, an arrow function now you might wonder why graphql needs to know all of this uh, and that's because when you're using graphical it will use the name and description to guide people around your api so these pieces of strings here these texts will appear to people using your uh, api through graphical and that's very easy for them to familiarize themselves with your api so let's populate the fields now let's take a look in fake database to see what fields author has there so here we can see that an author has an id a name and an email address now also note the types of these fields so id is a string name is a string and also email is a string now why is this important well that's because graphql is statically typed and that means that we have to specify what type each field is so let's go back to author and let's add the fields right now. I'm gonna start with ID and I'm gonna say that ID is of type GraphQL string. Again, these are special objects. These are special types that GraphQL uses to validate uh, the query uh, coming in from a user, but also to know beforehand what type of data it will return to the user. So we're gonna add the name field as well, which is also of GraphQL string and the email field which is also of type graphql string now just as before let's import graphql string before we forget it so i'm just going to add an import here and i'm going to say we also want to import graphql string from the graphql package all right so that's all we have to do to implement our author object Let's continue with making a type for comments. Now I'm gonna start by copying uh, this code because a lot of it is just boilerplate code and we can reuse it um, for our comment object type. So I'm gonna open up comment.js. I'm gonna paste in all of the code right here and I'm obviously gonna change some stuff. So I'm gonna export a comment variable. I'm gonna change the name. I'm gonna change the description. I'm gonna say details of a comment. And now obviously we also need to change uh, some of these fields. So let's take a look at fake database, what fields that a comment has. And here you can see comment has an ID, a post ID, name, and a content field. Now we're gonna ignore the post ID for now because that field creates a relationship with the post object, but we haven't created that yet. So we're gonna implement this later on. So let's go back to the comment type here. I'm going to remove these fields because we have to re-implement them. I'm going to say that comment has an ID and this time it's not of a uh, type string. It's actually of type GraphQL int. If we take a look back here, now it's an integer. It's not a string anymore. So we have to reflect that uh, in our fields here as well. A comment also has the name of the person who wrote it, which is obviously of type GraphQL string and it has the content of the post itself which is also of type graphql string now before we forget let's add the necessary imports we're using graphql int here but we're not importing it so let's fix that right now there we go that is the implementation for our comment object type now let's move on to the last type that we need and that is the object type for blog post now this one is a little bit more complicated because it has two relationships a blog post has an author and it might have some comments. And we definitely want to access both of these relationships through our GraphQL API. So again, I'm gonna start by copying the code from our comment type here, and I'm gonna paste it in our post.js file. I'll start again by changing some of these uh, things right here. So we're gonna export uh, a variable posts. We're gonna give it the name post, and the description is gonna be all details of a blog post. So let's take a look in fake database again uh, to see what fields a blog post has. And here we can see that blog post has an ID, which is an integer in this case. It also has a title, content, and an author. 
Now again, this author field is a reference to an author. It's, it creates a relationship. So we, we're gonna need to define that uh, as well. So let's add our fields. Let's go back to posts uh, so we can keep ID. Uh, we're gonna change name to title and we're gonna leave content as well. And the types are already correct. All right, so that's the basics done. But let's now implement the relationship that a post has with an author. So we're gonna add a field author here. And this field is gonna be a bit special. So we're gonna say that the type of this field is of type author, but that is not enough. We also need to tell GraphQL how it can get the details about this author, and that requires another call to our database. So we need to add a resolve function. And this resolve function, uh, I'm gonna use an, uh, an arrow function here as well, and it will receive a copy of our post object. And then we can do anything that we want with that post object, but we should return the information about the author that is linked to this blog post. So in fake database, I have a method for this, it's called get author. And we're just gonna return it here. We're gonna say return fake database dot get author. And we're gonna give it the ID of the author. And that is of course stored inside our post in the author fields. So what we're essentially doing is this variable right here, this post, it will get a full copy of one of these objects. And what do we need to get the author? Well, we take the author uh, field right here, we take its value, and then we pass that along to the get author method to get the details about an author. All right, so let's not forget to do the necessary imports. So I'm gonna add an import for author. I'm gonna import author from the author type, which is in the same directory. And I also need to import fake database which sits at the root of our source directory. All right, like that. So now we can implement another more complex relationship. A blog post can have one or more comments. So we say that the comment field will be of type comment, but it will be a list of comments. So how do we do that? Well, let's add another field here. I'm gonna call this comments. And this is of type comments, but again, we need a list of comments. So we're gonna wrap our comment type inside a new GraphQL list object, like that. And so now GraphQL knows that you will not return one comment, but that you might return one or more comments uh, in uh, with this field. So again, we're gonna add a resolve function. This resolve function will receive our post again. I'm gonna use an arrow function here, and we wanna return fake database dot get comments for posts and we're going to pass along the id of the post that we're using right now and let's again not forget to do the necessary imports i've used graphql list here so i need to import it from the graphql package so now that we know how to do these relationships let's head back to the author type now, it would be interesting if people could request all the blog posts that were written by a specific author. So let's add a post field um, to the object type for author. So I'm gonna call it post. It's gonna be of type post, but it's gonna be a list of posts. So it's a new GraphQL list object with our post object type. And we also need a resolve function, which is gonna receive the current author and what we want to do is we want to return fake database dot get posts of author and we're going to pass along the author id and again let's not forget to do the necessary imports i'm using graphql list from the graphql package i also need to import the post uh, object type from the current directory and I need to import fake database which again sits at the root of our source directory. All right, so that was it for this video. We've implemented all of our GraphQL object types. Again, these tell GraphQL which fields we want to expose to our users and how it should cope with the relationship 
between our data. However, we also need to tell GraphQL how it can fetch the entities in the first place. So right now, we told GraphQL what fields a blog post has, but we haven't told it how it can actually fetch a blog post from the database. So in the next video, we will fix that and we will implement queries. It also helps GraphQL understand the relationship between objects. But there is a problem. Here's a GraphQL query that fetches details about a blog post and about the author who wrote them. Now, after the previous video, GraphQL is able to fetch the details about an author because we implemented a resolve function that handles the relationship between post and author. However, GraphQL does not know how it can fetch the root field here. For that, we need to implement some queries. Now, we're going to implement three queries. One to get all the blog posts, one to get details about a specific post, and one to get a specific author. Now, the last two will require an argument. So let's get started. So I'm back in Visual Studio Code, and we're going to start by implementing the posts query. So I'm going to open up the post.js file inside of our query directory. And I'm going to start by exporting a default object. So I'm going to export default. And inside this object, I'm going to create a property called posts. And this will also be the name of our query. So choose it wisely because people will be using it when they use your API. Now posts again is an object which contains the details about our query. So first we have to tell GraphQL what type of data this will return. In our case, it will return a list of blog posts. So the type is new GraphQL lists of posts. And we also need to give it a description. So I'm going to say get a list of recent blog posts. That's a pretty nice description. Again, this description will show up when people are using graphical. So writing a good description will help your users adopt your API faster because they get a little bit of help. Now we can also accept arguments if we want to or if we need to. But in this case, we don't need to accept any. So I'm going to leave this object empty. Now, finally, we need again, a resolve function that will actually go out to the database and fetch the data that we need. So I'm going to write resolve. I'm going to give it a function. And this time I'm just going to call fake database and I'm just going to get a list of blog posts. So again, in our case, fake database is a database abstraction. It handles all the communication with uh, an actual database. So in reality, you can use the same code as I do right here, but you just need to change the implementation of the GAN blog post method. Okay, so that's it for uh, this query. It's pretty simple. The only thing I need to do is we need to make sure that we import the necessary dependencies. So we need GraphQL list from the GraphQL package. We need the post object type from our types directory. And we need fake database, which sits at the root of our source directory. So let's move on now and implement the author query. So I'm gonna copy and paste this code uh, because yeah, again, a lot of this code uh, is similar for uh, author. So I'm going to open up the author.js file inside of our query directory. I'm going to paste all of the code in here and I'm going to start by changing the name of this field here. I'm going to call this author and I'm also going to change the description and I'm going to say that this query gets a specific author. And there we go. We also need to change the type. So now we won't return a list of posts anymore. We will actually return the details about an author. And we also need some arguments now because if I want to get the details about a specific author, then GraphQL needs to know which author I want to get the details about. So I'm going to say that this query accepts an argument called ID. And this argument should be of type GraphQL string. But we can do more here. 
This query cannot work without an argument. If you want the details about an author, you have to specify an ID. If GraphQL does not have an ID, then it cannot fetch the details about an author because it doesn't know what author it needs to fetch data on. So we can wrap this GraphQL string inside a new GraphQL non-null object. And this will tell GraphQL that the argument is required. And in fact, GraphQL validates queries before it executes them. And so if it sees that the ID argument is missing, it won't even execute your query and it won't interact with your database. Pretty handy. And finally, we need to implement or we need to change better the resolve function. So this function will now receive two parameters instead of one. First, it will receive the parent object and secondly, it will receive all the arguments for this query. Now I could write something like this. I could say parent arguments and then I could call the fake database and I can say get author and then I'm going to take the arguments, which is basically a copy of this object, but then filled in with actual values. So I can say arguments.id. But I can also directly take the ID argument by using ECMAScript 6 destructing assignments. And what I can do is instead of using arguments, I can use syntax like this. And what this will do is this will extract the ID field from the object that this function gets as a second parameter. And then I can just use ID like that. So it's a bit shorter syntax. It's also new syntax. So let's keep that for now. All right, so again, to finish off this query, I need to fix our imports. Uh, we don't need GraphQL list anymore, but we do, however, need GraphQL string and we do need GraphQL non null. And we also need to import author and we don't need posts anymore. So I'm going to import author from the author post and we can keep our import for the fake database. All right, so let's move on to the final query. I'm going to copy this code again. And this time we're going to implement our post query. So I'm going to paste uh, our code in here. And this will allow users to fetch the details about a specific blog post. Um, so again, we need to change it a little bit. I'm going to call this query just post. It's going to return a post object. And we're going to give it a better description as well. We're going to say get details about a specific post. There we go. Now we're going to keep this ID argument right here because the user should pass it along if he wants to get information about a specific post. However, the ID of a post is not a string, it's an integer. So we need to change the type here to GraphQL int. Now the resolve function is almost identical as well. So we keep receiving the parent object and we keep extracting the ID field from the arguments, but we need to change the method that we use on our fake database. So we don't need to get the author, we need to get blog posts. So as always, let's fix our imports. Uh, we don't need the author import anymore. Now we need to import posts. And we don't need GraphQL string, but we need GraphQL int. All right, I'm going to save the file and that's it. We've now implemented the queries for our API. In the next video, we will implement some input object types, and this will form the basis of our mutations that we will make in the video after that one. Well, input object types are almost exactly the same, except that they are being used for when users send data to your API. Input object types help GraphQL to check if a user has given it all the necessary fields and if those fields are of the correct type. So to summarize, you can say that object types are used in queries for when people are requesting data from your API. Input object types are used in mutations where people are sending data to your API. So let's implement two input object types for our blog API. I want authors to be able to create new blog posts and I want users to be able to post comments through our GraphQL API. 
So let's start with creating an input object type for the new blog post. I'm going to store these input object types in the same file as the regular types. So I'm going to open up the posts.js file inside our types directory. And I'm going to export a new constant called post input type. And this will be a new GraphQL input object type. And again, we're going to pass an object uh, in its constructor. Now an input object type is very similar to a regular input type in the sense that they also need a name, a description and some fields. So I'm just going to give it a name, I'm going to call it post input. And then I'm going to give it some fields. Now what fields do we include here? Well, I'm going to say that when an author creates a new blog post, we need to know the title, the content, and the author ID. So I'm just going to call that field author. Now we also need to define the type of each field again. So the title will be of type GraphQL string. And same goes for content and for author because in the fake database we've implemented the author ID as a string. But there is more. They're not just strings, they are required strings. They cannot be empty because a blog post without a title or without content or without an author should not exist. So we need to wrap our types inside a GraphQL non-null object. So I'm going to say that the type is new GraphQL non-null and I'm going to wrap GraphQL string inside of that. And I'm going to do the same thing for these three fields. Now, before we forget, let's also add imports for GraphQL input object type and GraphQL non-null at the top of our file. So GraphQL input object type and GraphQL non-null. There we go. So let's now move on to the input object type for comments. I'm going to copy this code right here and I'm going to open up our comment type and I'm going to paste the code there. Now, of course, we're going to change the name of this variable. We're going to say comment input type and we're going to give it a different name. Comment input, I'm going to call this. And we need to change the fields uh, as well. So when you post the comment, we need to know your name, the contents of your comment and the ID of the post on which you want to leave your comment. So I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to ask for your name, content we can keep. And of course, the ID of the post that you want to make your comment on. Now let's check if the types are correct. Name and content should be of GraphQL string. But post ID, the ID of a post in our fake database is of type integer. So we will require a GraphQL int here as well. So once more, let's fix our imports. We need to import GraphQL input object type. We need to import GraphQL non null and GraphQL int. And that was it for this video. Again, we've created the input object types that we will use in our mutations. Right now, GraphQL knows what fields the user should give if he wants to create a new blog post or if he wants to create a new comment. However, GraphQL doesn't know how it should write them to the database. So in the next video, we will implement mutations so that we can save this data to our database. Well, in this video, we will implement two mutations for our GraphQL API. Now, if you don't remember what mutations are, check out section two of this course to refresh your memory. So the two mutations are one to allow authors to post new blog posts in our database and another one to allow users to post comments on blog posts. So let's start with the at post mutations. Now, because mutations are very much like queries, I'll start by copying the code of our post query. So I'm going to open up the post query here. I'm going to select all the code I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to paste it into the add file inside our mutations directory.
Now again, we need to adapt this a bit. For starters, I'm gonna call this mutation add post. And this mutation will write a new blog post to the database, but it will also return the newly created blog post so the user can work with it if he wants. So I'm gonna keep the type uh, set to post here. We're also gonna give it a proper description. We're gonna say that this creates a new blog post and it should also accept an argument. Now, if a user wants to create a new blog post, he should pass along the data. Now I could create an argument for each field for our post. So that would be an argument for the title, another argument for content, and another one for the author's ID. However, a more efficient way is to use the input object type that we created in the last video. So I'm just gonna create one argument and I'm gonna remove the one that we have right now. And I'm going to create a single argument called post. And I'm going to say that post should be of type post input type. Now we also need a resolve function to tell GraphQL what it should do once it receives this data from a user. So this is a function that again, it will receive uh, our parent variable and it will receive all the arguments that were passed to this mutation. So what we will do here is we will extract the post argument for our resolve function. And the only thing that we need to do is we need to make a call to fake database and we need to add a new blog post. And I've already made um, that method at new blog post. And of course, we're gonna pass our post argument that we received here. We're gonna pass that along to that method. Now we also return this because in GraphQL, a lot of mutations return the same object that you've just created. So in our case, if you run the mutation at post, it will actually return the data that it has actually submitted to the database. And that might be interesting. For example, if you create a new post and you give it your author ID, you get that post back, but then you can ask, for example, for the name of the author, which again involves some relationships. Now, before we continue, we need to fix our imports once again, so we can keep the post import here, but we need an import for uh, our post input type. So I'm just gonna say we import post from the types post and we also need post input type. All right, so I'm gonna save the file and let's now do our second mutation and that is add comment. Now, before we can do that, we need to make sure that our database abstraction can handle that. And right now it has no method that allows you to create a new comment. So let's create that method first. I'm gonna open up fake database here and I'm gonna scroll down all the way to the bottom. And here I've got some write methods and right now I only have add new blog post here. So I'm gonna add a method called add new comment. And this will receive a comment object from our GraphQL resolve function. And all that this method should do is give comment a valid ID, push it to the array right here, the array that contains all of our content comments, uh, and then it should return the newly created comment. So let's do that right now. We're gonna start by giving comment an ID. So I could give it a unique ID here, but I'm just gonna say this.comments.length plus one. So if there are five comments in the database, then the ID of the new comment will be five plus one, and that will be six. Then afterwards, we're gonna push it onto the array. We're gonna say this.comment.push. We're gonna push that comment onto it, and then we're gonna return the comment as well so that our GraphQL API can present it to the user. All right, so let's now implement the mutation. I'm gonna open up the add comment file and I'm first going to copy everything from add post. I'm gonna paste that in there. I'm gonna change the name, I'm gonna call it add comment. This will return a comment object. We're also gonna give it a more proper description. We're gonna say creates a new comment for a blog post. This will receive an argument, but it won't receive a post, it will receive a comment and that will be of comment input type. And in our resolve function, we need to grab our comment argument, this one right here. And then we need to call fake database and we need to say add new comments. And then we're gonna pass along the comment argument right there. So to finish up, let's fix our imports. So we need to import 
comments we need to input we need to import comment input type and we import it from our comment types file which is located in our types directory all right, let's save the file. And that was it for this video. We've implemented the mutations that will allow people to submit new data to our GraphQL API. Now we're almost ready to test our GraphQL API. In the next video, we will throw everything together to create our schema, and then we're done. So let's continue with the next video. And now it's time to bring all of these together in our schema. Now a schema basically tells GraphQL how it can expose your data to clients and how clients can send new data to the API. The schema defines the shape of all that data. Now our schema will live in the index.js file inside our schema directory. So I'm going to collapse these folders here and I'm going to open up the index.js file. So let's start by creating a constant called schema. And this will be a new GraphQL schema. And again, in its constructor, we're going to pass an empty object. Inside this object, we're going to define two properties, a property for query and a property for mutations. So we're going to say query, which is a new GraphQL object type. Again, initialize it with an empty object. And it will also have a mutation which is also a new GraphQL object type. So let's implement the query. Because this is a GraphQL object type, it requires a name and optionally a description, just as we did with our object types for post, comment, and author. So I'm gonna give query a name. I'm gonna say that this is our root query. And we also need to give it some fields, fields that the user can request. And these are the top level fields. These are the root fields that your user can work with. So I'm going to add a property field here. And we're going to use an arrow function, which returns an object. And this will make sure that we keep our scope, that we can access all the variables and methods that we have inside this file. Now, in our case, we've defined queries and mutations in other files. So we need to import them first before we can work with it. So we're going to import posts from our queries folder posts. We're going to import our post query also from queries post JS. And then we're going to import the author query from queries slash author. While we're at it, we're also going to import GraphQL schema and GraphQL object type. So import GraphQL schema and GraphQL object type from the GraphQL package. There you go. And now that we've imported our queries, we can just add them as fields here. And to do that, I'm going to use the spread operator. So I'm going to say dot, 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 posts, dot, 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 posts and dot, 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 author. Now the spread operator will take the contents of posts, author, and post, and it will place these contents inside this object right here. So it's almost like they're right there, except that we import them from a different file to make our project easier to maintain and easier to understand. Now we can do the same thing for mutations. So we're gonna import them as well. We're gonna say import add posts, from mutations slash add posts. And we're going to import add comments from dot slash mutation slash add comments. And now we can add them here as well. So we're going to give our mutation a name. It's going to be the root mutation. And it's going to receive some fields, which again is an arrow function, which returns an object. And we're going to use the spread operator to add the contents for add post and add comment. All right, I'm going to save the file. And that was it for this video. We have taken all of our building blocks, our queries and our mutations, and we've put them inside our schema. And now GraphQL can use that schema 
to handle our queries and our mutations. Now in the next video, we are finally ready to test our API and to see it in action. Hi everyone, in the last video, we created our GraphQL schema and that means that now we have everything we need to start using our API. So in this video, we will test if our API works properly. Now I'm going to implement this in the index file inside our source directory. And this contains some test code that we used in uh, one of the earlier sections. So I'm going to keep the import to GraphQL, but I'm going to remove the console log here. Now besides GraphQL, we also need to import our schema because GraphQL needs our schema to know what object types we have in our APIs, what queries we allow and what mutations we have. So we're going to import, oops, let's scroll up. Let's scroll back up again. So we're going to import schema from the schema directory. And with these two loaded, we can now start writing a GraphQL query. So I'm going to create a constant called query and I'm going to initialize it. And here I'm using a template literal because then I can use line breaks without having to worry about quotes. However, you can also use regular strings. It's all the same. So our query will be a very simple one. Let's assume that I want a list of all blog posts and from each blog post, I want the title. So in GraphQL, you create an object, then you say, I want the posts, the blog posts, and from each blog post, I want the title. Very simple. So now that we have our query, we can execute it against our schema. So I'm going to call GraphQL, which we imported uh, here. And I'm going to give GraphQL our schema, which we also imported here. And then we're going to pass along our query. Now GraphQL works asynchronously. And that means that here it returns a promise. So we have to wait for the output if we want to work with it. So to do that with promises, you have to add a then method, which will receive the result from GraphQL. This will be an arrow function. And then in here, we can work with the result. So all that I'm going to do is I'm going to console log the result so that we can see what's in it. However, note that the result data that we get back from GraphQL will be all JavaScript objects. And if you want to see what's inside an object, you need to stringify first. So I will call json.stringify on our result. And I also want the result to be a bit pretty. It needs to be formatted. So I'm going to give it uh, two additional parameters. The first one I'm going to set to null. That's because we want to stringify all the fields. And then we're going to pass along the number two. And this means that it will indent uh, our, our object here, our result object with two spaces. And that will make it easier to read. All right, one more thing that we need to do. Here we're handling the promise with a then, but we're not handling any errors. So we're going to add a catch method here. And if there should be an error, we're just going to log it to the console so that we know about any potential errors. So I'm going to save the file and I'm going to test our GraphQL API. I'm going to open up the terminal here and I'm going to run our build script first, npm run build. Again, we've defined this in one of the previous videos. This will run Babel. And apparently we have a little bit of an issue. Let's see here. Duplicate declaration GraphQL int. So it appears that we've imported GraphQL int twice in our comment object. So let's take a look at comments. And yep, there we go. Let's remove that. Let's run Babel again, see if there are any more issues in our code base. They there are. So let's take a look now. Comment is not defined in our post object types. So let's see. Yep, we're using comment here, but we haven't imported it. So let's import that right now. We're going to import comments from our comment object type. And there we go. Let's run it once more. And now it says schema must be an instance of GraphQL schema. So something is up with our schema. Let's open it up. And the problem is I forgot to export our schema. So we're defining a schema here, but we're not exporting it. So all we need to do is say export default schema. And now everything should be fine. Let's run it again. 
And there you go, our GraphQL API works. So this is the response that we get to our query. So let's open up the query. So we've asked for all the posts in our blog post and we've asked for the title of each of those blog posts. And so we get posts back, which is an array and it contains one object per post in our database with the title of the post. So let's finish up by testing a more advanced query that also uses relationships. Let's say that I want a list of all the blog posts with the name of the author who wrote them. So we want the title. I'm going to say we also want the author and we want the name of the author. So let's save the file. Let's run our build script again. And sure enough, now we get a list of blog posts with their title, with an author field and with the name of the author. So that was it for this video and for this section. Our GraphQL API implementation is now complete and it actually works. In the next section, I will show you how you can set up graphical so that you can test your API with a very nice web interface and even get features like autocomplete as you're typing your query. After that, I'll show you how to install and set up graphical for our own API. And finally, I will show you how to use Graphical itself. So let's start by explaining what Graphical is. I've used this tool in earlier videos to explain the core concepts of GraphQL. Now to test your API, you need to make requests to a web server. Now you can do that by writing some small scripts or you can use apps that are specifically designed for it. In case of REST APIs, there are many tools that do this. I'm thinking of tools like Postman, PAW, the built-in REST client of JetBrain IDEs, and so on. Graphical is just like those tools, except that it works with a GraphQL API instead of a REST API. But it doesn't stop there. Graphical is much smarter than any other API tool. It integrates with your GraphQL API and it asks it about all the supported queries, mutations, and types. Now with that information, Graphical is able to offer you syntax highlighting, intelligent auto-completing, real-time error highlighting, and automatic query completion. In fact, Graphical is being described as an IDE for GraphQL. And best of all, it runs completely in your browser. So let's dive right in. In the next video, we will add Graphical as a dependency and write a small bit of code to make it actually run. Now, before we can use Graphical, however, we need to make sure that our API is accessible with an HTTP call. So we need to run our web server for that. Now in the Node.js world, a lot of people use Express. It's a simple web application framework, and there's even a Node package that sets up Graphical together with Express. So let's install that into our project. I'm going to open up a terminal, and I'm going to run npm install dash dash save to tell GraphQL that it should save this dependency in our package.json file. And then I'm gonna say that it should install Express and Express GraphQL. And this last one will provide the integration between GraphQL and Express so that we don't have to write that ourselves. So let's run that now. Now with those installed, we need a small piece of JavaScript that starts an Express server and links Graphical to it. For that, I'm going to create a new file inside our source directory, and I'm going to call this serve.js. I'm gonna close the terminal, and I'm going to start by importing our dependencies. We'll start by importing Express from the Express package, and we will also import GraphQL HTTP from the Express GraphQL library. And again, this is a special package that makes GraphQL and Graphical compatible with Express. Now, finally, because we want to execute queries, we need to import our schema so that GraphQL knows what data we have and how we can access it. So I'm going to import the schema from this directory. Now with that done, we can create a new web server. And so I'm going to create a new constant called app and I'm going to initialize a new Express object here. So at this point, we have a web server, but it doesn't have any endpoints yet. So I'm going to add it by saying 
app.use and this requires two parameters. The first one is the endpoint that you want to expose and the second one is a function that will respond to a request. So I'll expose the slash GraphQL endpoint and now we need to specify which function will handle our request. And we will use GraphQL HTTP from the package that we've just imported here. So I'm gonna call GraphQL HTTP. And inside its constructor, I'm going to pass an empty object. And here we can pass along the options for GraphQL HTTP. So first up, we're going to pass our schema to it. So that, so that it knows what queries we support and how it should talk to our database. And then we're going to enable graphical by just setting the graphical property to true. All right, we're almost done now. The last thing that we need to do is we need to start our web server by saying that our app should listen on a specific port. So I'm going to say uh, on the console, starting the server so that we have a bit of feedback. And then I'm going to say app.listen and I'm going to make our app listen on port 4000. Now remember, if we want to run the script, we need to run Babel first and then we need to run our script. So let's automate that by creating a new script in our package.json file. So I'm gonna open up the package.json file here and I'm going to create a new script here and I'm gonna call the script serve and the first thing that it should do is it actually should build our project. So I'm going to say babel source and then the output directory is this. And the second command that it should run is it should run our serve.js file with node.js. So I'm gonna do that, node this serve.js. All right, so let's save the file and let's try it out. I'm going to open up the terminal and I'm going to run npm run surf. And as you can see, this script now runs Babel to transpile our JavaScript code, as you can see here. And then it also runs our web server. This is the message from our serve.js file. And you can also see that it keeps my terminal prompt busy because the web server is actually running. So right now I cannot type a new command in my terminal because the web server uh, is still running. Our Node.js process is waiting for incoming requests. So that was it for this video. Our web server is up and running. It's ready to receive requests. So in the next video, we will use graphical. It's another advantage that GraphQL APIs have over traditional APIs. So just to recap the last video, you have to run our serve script to start the Express web application that will host graphical. So I'm gonna open up the terminal and inside our project right here, I'm just going to run npm run serve. And again, this will start our Express server and let's now open up Chrome and let's go to localhost 4000, that is the port that we configured Express to run on, uh, slash GraphQL. And we're now greeted by Graphical. Now, its interface is pretty simple. On the left side, you can see uh, the query and the mutation that you're executing right now. Once they're executed, GraphQL will show them on the right side of the screen. Now at the top, you also have some tools. You have a play button, which executes your code, a preify button to properly format and indent your queries right here. And you have a history button, which opens up another panel showing your recently made queries. So let's write a simple query that gets a list of blog posts with the title for each. Now let's also assume that I'm a new user who hasn't used this API before and that there is no documentation. Now using a REST API without proper documentation can be a nightmare. But how will it go with GraphQL? Well, let's start by saying that I wanna write a query. I'm gonna open up the curly braces and as a new user, I don't know what root fields this API supports. So I'm just going to bring up the autocomplete by hitting control space. Now this is the same shortcut that many IDEs use as well. 
So here we get a list of supported root fields and we even get a nice description. So here we see posts and the description is get a list of recent blog posts. Now remember, we defined this description in the schema. Now it might have looked a bit weird to define them in the schema, but here they truly come to fruition. So let's get a list of blog posts. I'm going to hit enter and I'm going to open up the curly braces again. And just as before, I can now ask graphical for the fields that I can request. And sure enough, there are all the fields that we can request. So I can pick title, for example, and hit tab, and it will fill in title in our query. So let's now test this query. Let's execute it by clicking on the play button. And as you can see, we get a list of blog posts on the right hand side. Pretty simple. Now I can keep changing my query. Let's see what graphical does when I don't give it a complete query. Let's say that I also want the name of the author, but that I just ask for the author field here. Let's assume that I don't know that I have to subselect the name of an author. Now this should not work because we have to specify which fields of author we want, but let's run it anyway. So I'm going to click play. And as you can see, graphical picked up on it and it has added the ID field automatically before executing our query. So it handles our errors by trying to correct them beforehand. And in this case, it works pretty well. Now let's make it a bit harder. Instead of title, let's make a typo and let's ask for title like this. Now, as you can see, GraphQL doesn't catch this error. It doesn't prompt us. It doesn't warn us that this is an invalid query. But if I run this, you'll see that GraphQL does. And it says that we cannot ask for a field title because that's not available on our post type. And it also tries to be helpful. And it says, did you mean title? And of course we did. Also pretty handy. Now, finally, I want to show you the documentation panel. So if you click on docs here in the right hand corner, a panel will open up with the documentation that GraphQL has extracted from our schema. So I can see what queries are possible, for example. So let's open up the root query here to see what root fields I can request. And sure enough, here are three root fields. I can ask for posts for a single post or for the details about an author. And it even shows what kind of data it returns. So post returns an array of post objects and our post field accepts an argument ID, which should be of type integer. And we didn't have to do anything for this. Again, it extracted this from the descriptions in our schema and from our return types. Now I can keep clicking on fields uh, inside here. So if I want to know what a post object looks like, I just click it and then I can see that a post has all the details of a blog post and I can see the fields that it has. So that was it for this video. Hopefully you realize how powerful GraphQL is. The next section will wrap up this course. We'll talk about the conclusion and I will give you some interesting resources to continue your GraphQL quest. I hope you enjoyed these videos and that you've learned a lot from them. GraphQL is an amazing tool and even though it is still very young, it's already being deployed in large companies like Facebook, GitHub, Yelp and many more. And now you know how you can build your own GraphQL API. Now, if you have any questions or suggestions for future courses, definitely let me know. I greatly appreciate any feedback you might have. I've also published the source code that was used during this course. You can download it as a zip file and use it as a template to start building your own GraphQL API.